I think it's about time we got started. It's good to see you all. It's good to see there's a good group of people left. Uh, this is the our final uh, panel of the day, but certainly not the the uh, least panel, last but not least panel of the day. Thank you all for joining us um, for session three, which is beyond technical, and it gets into policy adoption and health concerns related to privacy and contact tracing and proximity notification. Uh, I'm incredibly excited about our keynote speaker and the panelists that we have uh, lined up uh, uh, today. Um, I'm going to, we're going to have a, first a keynote, keynote talk from Julie Schaefer, uh, and then we're going to have about an hour and a half panel discussion. Um, so first I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian Cunningham, uh, the creative director of UCI Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute to tell us a little bit about our keynote speaker. And then um, we will have that talk and then I will introduce our panel and we will go to panel discussion. And Brian will also, Brian and Julie will also be joining us on the panel. Thank you, Woody. Uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, still awake, particularly if you're in uh, European or or farther time zones. Uh, thanks also to my UCI colleagues, Athena and Jean, for such a powerful, enlightening, and provocative morning. And thanks to all of the folks that made it that way. <clears throat> Very exciting for me to be here with a lot of old colleagues and friends, uh, not by any stretch the least, least of which Dr. Julie Schaefer. Julie is the Chief Technology Officer for Flu Lab, where she seeks to stretch the boundaries of how technology is used in order to defeat influenza and more recently COVID-19. I would have to say that's a, a timely meeting of uh, experience and skill to the moment. Before moving to the philanthropic world, Julie spent 15 years in the US government, most recently as director of strategy at the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA, which is charged with developing vaccines, treatments and diagnostics for international and naturally emerging threats. Also timely. Uh, prior to that, she served as Director for Medical and Biodefense Preparedness Policy in the White House National Security Council, and during her time at, DA, at the Department of Health and Human Services in the U.S. government, Julie co-developed numerous strategies and plans, including the HHS Pandemic Influenza Plan, and co-founded a new division in BARDA devoted to accelerating transformative solutions to drive uh, to dire health security threats. No word uh, about whether they've done anything about zombies, but we'll let Julie talk to you about that. Uh, <clears throat> finally, Julie is a, a valued colleague of mine in a public health messaging nonprofit that we both serve called No COVID. And I'm pleased to say a friend, we couldn't have a better afternoon keynote. Welcome, Julie. Thanks so much. And now comes the most stressful part of my days when I try to share my slides. I'm gonna hope for the best team. Okay. All right, so thanks everybody for, uh, well, first of all, for, for having me here and to talk about pretty much my favorite thing to talk about. So um, I'll be keeping a, a close eye on, on my time so that I, because uh, I can, this is, this is definitely my passion. Um, so just a quick note about Flu Lab. Uh, we're an organization that makes uh, grants and investments in, um, in technologies and, approach, and approaches to defeat influenza and, and certainly COVID-19 now. And you know, our philosophy, we really look to put attention and focus on, on um, area, areas to really stretch the boundaries of uh, and, and to, to reduce, I would say, um, the kind of stovepipes that can exist, especially in a field like influenza uh, in which we, you know, this is a foe that we have uh, lived with for a long time, but we still have some, um, some stubborn challenges. And so that's just a little bit about us. Um, just a little bit about our time together. Everyone likes an agenda to frame. Just a little bit about where we are in the pandemic. Uh, a bit about the tools that we have to address the pandemic. And then um, I hope that you'll, you'll join me in dreaming a little bit about what, um, what the future could hold that would enable us to respond better. So we are going to talk that we are talking a little bit about the, the, the plans. Did we have pandemic plans? We sure did. Um, you know, I, I thought we'd start with a few quotes. 
The first one is usually, um, usually summarizes no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Um, and the second one is a bit more, more hopeful. It's from a, a former president of ours uh, in the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And, um, you, you know, it, it says the plans are worthless, but the planning is everything. And you know, and I bolded the section because the very definition of an emergency is that it is unexpected, and therefore things are not going to happen the way you are planning. So let's talk about plans for just a, a short second. So there, there was a, an incredibly intense focus around pandemic planning that started around 2005 in the United States, with the World Health Organization, and in a number of other countries. In the United States, um, a lot of that planning, uh, the, the, the reasons behind that, the, the, and the energy behind that focus on planning had um, relates to events that had happened in the recent past, uh, starting was, well, I mean, it's hard to say where it started, but, but certainly influencing events were the terrorist attacks of September 11th in 2001, um, and then the anthrax letters that were around the same time. Um, uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina, which uh, which exposed um, what happens when different parts of government are not able to communicate with each other easily, and how quickly uh, things can break down. And then around the world, another focusing event that spurred this this planning was uh, the emergence of avian influenza H5N1. Now this virus still exists. There are many different, many different uh, strains of permutations of it. Um, but at the time, and around, to, especially around 2004, there were um, outbreaks that were happening in different parts of the world. And the, and the thing about this virus is it still has an incredibly high case fatality rate. And, and that um, if uh, for in humans that are, uh, un, that are unlike, unlucky and become infected, um, there's around 60% chance that they, that they will die from it. So it's still a, a really severe, uh, causes really severe infections. At the time there was concern, well, what if something like this became easy to spread amongst people? What would that look like? That would look like a severe pandemic. That would look like something that like happened in 1918. And boy, oh boy, do we need to plan. And the last thing I would say about that is that the kind of planning that a lot of these plans, like these little bubbles that I have, um, talked about was planning that's outside just public health. So it's looking at how do we look at a pandemic planning in the in, that for anticipating a pandemic that would have social and economic incredibly cascading effects in, in social economic cascading effects. So in many ways, the pandemic we're in is the pandemic that, would, that a lot of these plans anticipated with one key difference. These plans all uh, were anticipating an influenza pandemic. So there was an anticipating that the, some of the tools that we're going to talk about um, coming up were um, would, we would be in a different place developmentally with them because of where we are in, with influenza compared with other emerging infectious diseases like, say, uh, a novel coronavirus. Just to remind you, I'm sure many of you have seen this graph, which um, came from some early planning. I think the original, uh, it, it was a, a, a old friend of mine who was not very agile with, with PowerPoint. So it's quite, a, or graphic. So it's quite amazing that he, he developed this. But um, just to go over what, well, what, when you do plans, when you, when you're, when you have tools, what are you trying to do here? The first thing you're trying to do, well, the first thing you're trying to do is squash it. Let's not have a pandemic at all. Let's squash it out, an outbreak. If that's not possible, the next thing you're trying to do is delay the, the outbreak peak. You're trying to buy as much time as possible and, and so that, so that you can kind of rev up your, um, other tools, especially medical countermeasures like vaccines and treatments, make sure that you have uh, uh, you, you have your your um, healthcare systems readied for uh, for a whole lot of people needing services at the same time. Um, you're also the, your other goals are to decompress that peak burden in hospitals and in, in, in the infrastructure. So in the community, you don't want everyone to get sick all at the same time because. Pretty much everywhere in the world, hospitals and other healthcare settings, just they, do, they don't have a lot of slack in the system. So, they, they, so the, a system is not, no system is really equipped to have a whole bunch of people get sick at the same time. And a feature of um, infections, uh, uh, that severe illness from 
from SARS-CoV-2 or you know COVID-19, you know the, the illness we call COVID-19, is that um, when people are hospitalized, when they become severely ill, they stay hospitalized for a long time. So that puts even more pressure on hospital systems. And of course, the overall goal is just to diminish the, the total number of cases and the and the total health impact. So these are this is what what we're trying to do with the with the tools that um, we're going to talk about. So I know that the tool that we're really gathered to talk <laughs> most of today is about is about contact tracing. But I did want to highlight some of the other tools and and and. Um, and bring up a few points about them. So in that white box, um, those are the tools, the, these are the tools that, that most of us are uh, experiencing every day. Um, we are living, we are living these tools right now. So um, isolation and quarantine, um, social distancing, so having space between people, um, face coverings, of course, and, and, and contact tracing, who I talked. Something that I wanted to mention about this, and it, that's quite kind of stunning when we think about uh, where we are, um, the advances that we have made um, in so many other aspects of our daily lives is that many of these are centuries old. So quarantine, that, you know, so that's 14th century Venice. Um, we, in, in the word, and in, in the, in the word goes around 40 days for how long people, they wanted uh, ships to stay uh, before docking to make sure that if there was any infectious disease on the ship, they wouldn't bring it on shore. But that 40 days, we think, was derived from some ancient Greek texts. Um, social distancing, some of the, you know, six feet or like how, you know, one meter or two meters, how far we need to be apart from each other. You know, some of the, the earliest literature on that is 1897. So, um, and, and face coverings, I mean, I'm sure all of us have seen kind of like the beak-like uh, plague masks, and then, um, and then the more, um, the, the photos that, that many of us have seen, especially recently from, from 1918. Um, you know, these are, these are not, <laughs> these are not new approaches that we're looking at, and, and contact tracing also has a long history that um, might have been covered in some earlier lectures. Um, you know, my, my, my point around that is that, um, this reflect, and what I would argue is that this reflects our priorities. So we are depending on these really old, these you know, these old tools because it is we have not put a priority on creating better tools to uh, to address a novel a novel infectious disease. This gray box. These are the these are the tools that um, are often need to be tailored to the pathogen in question. So, of course, diagnostics. Luckily, we can usually use platforms that um, you know we already basic technology and diagnostic um, technologies. But we do need specific um, material to, you know toward that pathogen. So reagents and assays and and um, treatments. Um, you know, when we talk about viruses, treatments are incredibly complicated. Um, antiviral treatments, I'm sure it, it would be great to have a lot of broad spectrum antiviral drugs so that it, it, if a new virus emerges, we've got a treatment that, that can work. Um, you know, something that, that's especially complicated about antivirals is that um, one can, it's, it's one can have a broad uh, a, a treatment that's really effective at ad addressing a whole lot of viruses, but it's but it's often not suitable for human use. So the thing that probably makes it so effective against viruses also makes it a little bit more effective against humans than we would we would like it to be. So it, it's very it's super uh, challenging. And then of course the last thing is is vaccines, and um, I think that many some of the things that came out. This is a, a big difference from when we talk about the tools that were planned on in, in all of those plans is that um, and how long we'd have to use those tools that are in the white box is that um, if we planned on an influenza pandemic, we have many, many licensed influenza vaccines. So the, the idea and the planning behind it is that, okay, we, we see a novel influenza virus. It's got pandemic potential. We think it's a pandemic. Well, then we immediately start making influenza, uh, influenza vaccines that are, that are tailored to that virus. That's not really that we were in a very different place developmentally with SARS-CoV-2 vaccines where we were didn't did not have vac uh, did not have um, vaccines that we could easily do a, a, a quick 
strain change, as we call it, um, like we do, you know, this is something we do every year with seasonal influenza vaccines. That's why you get one every year because they're slightly different. They have different strains in it. So instead of being able to do a strain change for a vaccine platform that we understand about, we had to kind of start really early in development. And so then that makes us dependent on these older tools that um, have a lot of cascade, can have a lot of cascading social and economic costs to them as, as we all are experiencing now. Um, we have to hold on to them a lot longer because the wait for vaccine is longer. Just a few points on um, vaccine. On, I mean, I recognize we're on we're in a contact tracing meeting, but it's but it's it's an important thing, and it, because it's a little different than a lot of the other plans, I thought it was worth focusing on. Um, boy, we're really early in development, but boy, are there a lot of options and. Um, Something that is, is quite amazing for those of us who work in this space is how quickly um, and how many vaccines are in phase three studies now, given how early we were in development when we started thinking about a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So um, you know, mo many of you might be aware that it can take around 15 years to develop a vaccine, and, and most of it is, is on the... It, it, on, on the, the early uh, development, and then um, and then these these large trials can take a long time as well. So to have eleven vaccines already in that space are quite amazing. I wanted to highlight um, a really for those of you who have interest in. Um, seeing where the different approaches, because that's another thing that's notable about the, the vaccines that are being uh, developed for, against SARS-CoV-2 is how many different platforms, novel platforms. So um, the, the, if these vaccines are licensed or, or available under emergency use, they'll, it'll be the first time that this platform will, will have been used in a vaccine that will be uh, administered, to, you know, widely uh, distributed and used in people. If you're interested in those technologies, I really recommend this beautiful article by Florian Kramer from Mount Sinai um, in Nature. Um, it's a really lovely explanation. And then if, for those of you who like to, to keep track of things, WHO is doing, uh, is doing a no joke, huge job in terms of keeping up, uh, updating daily the, the landscape of these vaccine candidates. So just a few more notes about speed because uh, it is quite, uh, this, it is quite amazing how quickly uh, these vaccines are, so many of them are, are reaching these later stages of development. But I also, it also goes back to, to what I mentioned about priorities. So you'll see at the bottom those really long timelines for diseases that, um, uh, natu naturally emerging diseases, um, novel viruses, uh, fairly novel, I'll say for Zika. Um, you see that, that really long timeline. So, Zika, um, we had we really didn't have any vaccine that that um, could could be uh, thought considered for Zika. So really starting from scratch. But you'll also see that that and SARS um, petered out. So so when the so we, there was an outbreak, there was a lot of concern. There were a lot of, there was a lot of funding put toward developing these um, vaccines and therapeutics around, uh, you know, to fight these viruses. But then when the, um, when the emergency died down, the funding went away and, you know, things are always happening and, and attention was diverted. We're seeing that we are directly experiencing the effects of that with, by not having developed that SARS vaccine in 2003. Um, we are it is we are in a much more difficult position now than we would have been if we had kept our eyes on the ball on that and followed through and developed a vaccine. So we so so there are true costs to um, to our um, short attention span for outbreaks and for public health and and this is uh, we're we're kind of living that right now. Another point that I just wanted to make, because um, certainly a lot of um, people reasonably ask, well, why is it, why are vaccines moving along much faster than they normally would? There's a, there's a lot of reasons. We do have some information about, more information about SARS-CoV-2 based on our experiences with SARS and, which is obviously closely related, and then also MERS, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is kind of a cousin of, um, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we had a scientific basis to understand what's the, what's the part of 
of this virus, of this variant that's important to focus on. We know, we, we believe it's the spike protein. So we, so we knew, so, so vaccine development was sped along from that. But the other thing is that normally, as we said, it takes about 15 years to develop the vaccine. We're gaining a lot of speed by doing things that are usually done sequentially at the same time. So we're doing them in parallel. So why don't we always do them in parallel? The biggest reason is economic. It is extremely expensive to develop vaccines. And so for to mitigate risk, economic risk, these steps are usually done step by step by step by step so that if there is a if a problem emerges in any step we you haven't lost money so if let's say there's a problem that emerged in trying to to manufacture more make more because it's kind of as, as you would imagine when we try to make more vaccine it's not like you know doubling a cookie recipe it's um it's it's a, it's a complicated process to do it's called scaling up so if a problem emerges during manufacturing um then in the, if you're not in the you don't want to be in the middle of doing large phase three studies, which are, which involve a lot of people and a, and a lot of usually com, uh, complex logistics um, because of the, the economic loss. In this case, governments, and especially the United States government, um, are, are investing billions of dollars to de-risk that for, for these van vaccine manufacturers so that they can do steps in parallel that they would normally do um, sequentially. So with the rest of my time, I just wanted to um, ask you to, to join me in some, some dreaming a little bit. Um, what could be and, and how could we better use the tools that are available to us, are nearly available to us, to make responses better and to, and, and to really improve health, I would argue, all the time. The, and so really what it, I'm going to focus on testing because it really what it, but I'm really talking about thinking about testing really differently. So many of us, when we think about testing, we think like, oh, something's happened. And then I go to a healthcare provider and then they admit or minister something. And maybe that gets um, processed at the doctor's office, or maybe it goes to a lab, but it's, it's something that I go seek healthcare for, you know, to address. What I'm proposing is really is, is integrating testing for infectious diseases that spread regularly. So right now it's COVID-19, but um, this could, I, I certainly would see clear applicability in influenza every year. Um, integrating, thinking, um, test, testing in a different way into our daily lives. So signaling. The question the signaling is trying to answer is, has something changed? So I, I think of it as the check engine light. So um, for a person that can be, um, that can be, then there's a lot of advancements around wearables and biosensors and things that are on the person or near the person that, um, so we, there's continuous, so, so wearables would be continuous monitoring. So, you know, the, detecting, using algorithms um, along with our wearables and that, that can detect cha meaningful changes that signal that kind of like that check engine light, something's changed. Um, but, you know, as we identify better biomarkers, it could, it, it could be just, sig you know, just pinging if that marker pings. It's also participatory surveillance. Now this exists right now, you know, COVID near you, flu near you, um, just that, that kind of asking people in communities, hey, how are you feeling? And to give on a, on a population level a sense of what's going on in, in um, a, a, a less sensitive, I guess, a less sensitive, less specific way, it's mo both less sensitive and less specific, but just a, a signal. Then we think about detection. So what I'm calling detection. So could this per person be currently infected with SARS-CoV-2? So what I'm talking about with that is um, we, it, we demand, and appropriately so, demand a, a certain, a certain uh, certainty of testing that if you go to the doctor's office, you want the test that you take there. You want to be pretty sure that it, if, if, it, if it says you're sick, you're sick, and if it says you're not sick, you're not sick. What if we had this kind of, this other category where it's, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's probably gonna pick it up, but we're really using, but we're using it a little differently. And that's where we can think about really low cost, incredibly fast, and um, really easy to use in uh, um, tests. So paper, so paper-based tests, 
um, that are really just giving, and, and I think that the, um, the antigen-based tests that are coming, become more are com becoming available in the United States, certainly. But thinking about them in terms of um, having them places in the home, having them at work and school for quick testing, and hey, we all, most of us, are live in environments where we regularly, well, when we were out and about, we go through metal detectors and other security, say for when we get to the airport or, you know, enter, uh, go to a, a lar an event where there's a, a large gathering of people. We have accepted that we, that, that, le that, that security is something that, that's how we, that's how we get to what we want. Can we integrate this kind of detection into, into that process and imagine what, how it would change the way infectious disease spreads in communities or to the way it would prevent the infectious diseases from spreading in communities if we could just pick out those people who are shedding a lot of virus. If we could just pick out those super spreaders, what could that mean? Um, move, you know, keeping, keeping on moving um, that for diagnosis of infections, of course, we, we want the you know, molecular tests, those, those really, those ones that, that have, you have a high degree of certainty that the test is, is, um, is has a high sensitivity and specificity. But what I would, I would say for that is that we want them available in multiple places. Not everyone needs to have home-based molecular tests. They're probably always gonna be kind of expensive. But what if more people had home-based molecular tests? And those people, when they use those tests and they, they get a, a positive result, they stay home. They don't, they don't guess and say, oh, I'm probably, probably okay. They stay home. Imagine how that would change how infectious disease spread in community. And last, I would just put a little point because I know a lot of people ask about antibody tests and um, you know, they, they answer, they ask, they, answer, they seek to answer a question if a person has been exposed and mounted a response, a, 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 um, an immune response to a, uh, to a particular pathogen, a virus. Um, I think that this is an, is an example of something that the policy meaning can change as we get more information. I think early on we were kind of hopeful that um, the widespread use of antibody tests would could even, and certainly there are some, um, some entities that were really interested in, in pursuing things like antibody passports, like immune passports, like, okay, I've got this test. It says, it says plus I have, you know, I, I have the antibodies. Um, we just don't know what those antibodies mean, and and there's increasing evidence that maybe those um, that you know that any if there is protective immunity um, for uh, for this virus, it doesn't last very long. So it, it doesn't look like those would be terribly meaningful. They may still have meaning on uh, on a population level to get a sense of what uh, just prevalence has has a virus been through this community. So um, as so of course the question will be, and, and I'm sure all of you are asking it every day, and, and um, is first of all, when will this end? And what, I can't offer any insights on that, but what I will offer is that I believe how it will end will be a layered approach. And um, I think that this, uh, I haven't really never decided who exactly coined this, but I'm going to credit uh, Marty Citron, a long time um, director of the Division of uh, Global Migration and Quarantine at CDC, what he called the Swiss cheese, uh, Swiss cheese approach, that each of these interventions is imperfect. But if you layer enough on them, all the holes are covered up. So vaccines, they are, uh, they are uh, probably a big component of how, we get out of, of how we get out of our current situation. They might be imperfect. They may not be the whole component. Well, it might still need for a, for a time to come to use those face coverings. Certainly, um, testing has a, huge, has a huge place so that we understand um, how, you know, the, how much virus is spreading in community treatments for the, to, to help those who become severely ill and continued public health measures like contact tracing and um, will certainly have a continued role. And just some closing two word thoughts to review what, what we just talked about is um, the, where we are now and where we're going are our are, are, are reflected priorities. We don't have necessarily the public health system that would be best to, uh, to have supported a, a response for this pandemic. That has to do with 
budget cuts that has to do with public health not always being a huge priority. We know a lot of these measures, what's important about them is that they build trust in the community. They build trust, and, and if that trust and if that trust is missing, these measures are hard to implement and they're not as effective. And my last point is just reminding you that it's Swiss cheese. It's not, it's um, not all or nothing with one intervention. It's, it's a bunch piled up together that will probably make the difference. And with that, I will uh, stop talking for a little while. Julie, that was great. Thank you so much for a really uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation. I was furiously scribbling notes throughout. I think I'm just going to have to go back and uh, maybe get your slides after the fact. So thank you. Um, so that actually does a really great job of teeing up uh, our panel for this afternoon, which I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, I'm, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time um, with, the, with everyone's full bios because they are on our website, so you can go and you can look at them. But I did want to say um, a few words about our panelists. Um, so Jessica Roberts is the Director of Health Law and Policy um, at Institute and the Leonard Childs Professor in Law and Professor of Medicine uh, at uh, the University of Houston. Um, I have to say I've had the pleasure of, of uh, knowing Jessica for a while and reading uh, a lot of her works. Um, and every single time I read her works, I come away with a really a, a fresh perspective on an issue that I did not know a lot about. And I'm continually amazed at Jessica's ability to definitely move between fields and disciplines with a lot of, of competence because um, I barely am sort of holding on to sort of privacy law as a concept. And Jessica is able to move uh, sort of fluidly from privacy to health and, and, and law and everything in between. Um, our, our next speaker is Brenda Leong, who, who is the Senior Counsel and Director of Artificial Intelligence and Ethics at the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, like Jessica, I've also had the pleasure of uh, reading Brenda's work for a while and also uh, uh, watching her interact on the public stage in a lot of uh, privacy and artificial intelligence policy related debates. Uh, and one of my favorite things about what Brenda does is immediately cuts through the noise and the jargon because there's a lot of it about artificial intelligence, right? There's a lot of hype words and a lot of a lot of stuff. And Brenda cuts straight through it and can identify, ask the right question at the right time about what really matters here. And that's something that I've always really appreciated about Brenda's approach. Um, next, we have Ashkan Soltani, who's a independent researcher and Georgetown Distinguished Fellow. Um, I, what can we say about Ashkan? He, he consults with uh, every, uh, lot, and I'm not going to say all the major tech companies because I actually don't know your full Rolodex. Lots of, uh, lots of technology companies. Um, uh, is one of the chief architects of the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, formerly served as the chief technologist to the Federal Trade Commission, was a co-author on the Washington Post's NSA series, uh, was a consultant on the What They Know series from the Wall Street Journal back in the day. For those of you that remember the uh, sort of what the hell moment, which that was definitely one of mine, uh, and he uh, contributed a bit to that, that project. Um, and so uh, I, and is it, it really been also at the center of a lot of uh, the discussion around proximity notification apps. And I really appreciate his ongoing involvement in this public debate and, and thrilled to have him here as well. Uh, Ashkan is also apparently my facial recognition doppelganger and the very first person that uh, a facial recognition algorithm mistook me for. I, I uploaded a photo one time and I said, do you want to tag Ashkan Sultani? And it was a photo of me. Um, so, uh, so we have that in common as well. And I'm, I'm happy that he's here. And then um, last but certainly not, not least, we have Brian Cunningham who's joining us on the panel. Uh, as I previously said, the executive director of UCI's multidisciplinary uh, cybersecurity policy and research institute. Um, I will tell everyone just go check out Brian's bio. Uh, he's someone that clearly knows his stuff and beyond that has been in a lot of positions where you have to know your stuff um, with uh, a lot of wisdom about making really difficult decisions um, when really difficult decisions have to be made. Um, and I, I just, I, I will put you over to his, 
to his resume to see um, the full extent of his government work, uh, as well as his work uh, in the private sector, um, which is extensive in cybersecurity and privacy uh, policy uh, and research issues. Uh, and then Julie will also be joining us on the panel. So um, thank you all for your time. And uh, I think Jessica, we will start with you talking about infectious disease surveillance, which is a perfect segue from Julie's keynote. Excellent, thanks so much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. And thanks so much to our organizers, uh, particularly Woody and Athena. So I am Jessica Roberts. Um, and as Woody mentioned in his introduction, I do write about a lot of different areas within law and within health law in particular. But one place where I've been spending a fair amount of my attention has been with regards to people's rights in their genetic data, but also their health-related data broadly. And the project that I want to share with you all this afternoon is actually a collaboration between myself um, and, some, and a couple of my colleagues at the University of Houston Law Center. So one of my co-authors is Emily Berman, and she writes about national security law. And my other co-author is Leah Fowler, and she writes about public health law. And in the early days of the pandemic, we were all struck by how national security experts spanning the ideological spectrum were weighing in on the legality and desirability of digital contact tracing efforts. And so law and order types advocated mandatory universal um, contact tracing while advocates of civil rights and civil liberties cautioned against mission creep and author authoritarian power grab. And indeed, these Fourth Amendment experts seemed right at home considering the benefits and the drawbacks of digital contact tracing efforts in the United States, except there was just one problem. Digital contact tracing is not national security surveillance. So efforts to track the spread of disease uh, sound squarely in the register of public health. So we asked ourselves, this question, you know, since seeming as we were one national security person and a couple different health folks, why were national security scholars so eager to weigh in? And what did that mean for digital contact tracing? And where we sit now, do any of those insights by about thinking about this interplay between national security and public health, can that help us explain why digital contact tracing efforts succeeded elsewhere, but seem to have largely stalled out in the United States? Um, and we actually start our, our uh, paper from the, the proposition that national security surveillance um, and disease control represent two distinct kinds of paradigms of monitoring. Um, and they, they differ across at least three different matrices. So that is the role of consent, the scope of the collection and the subsequent use. So traditionally contact tracing is cooperative. You need to, to talk to people and figure out what's happening with them and where they've been and, and, and whom they've been with. Um, it tends to minimize data collection to protect the privacy, privacy of the individuals who are implicated. Um, and also disease control and contact tracing generally restricts subsequent use. So you're not supposed to be able to repurpose this information that you collect in order to track the spread of disease. And this stands in stark contrast to national security, which by its very nature requires secrecy. So if you're engaging in national security surveillance, you don't want the target of your surveillance to know what you're doing. Um, also to national security surveillance maximizes the collection under the mosaic theory. You sort of don't know what's going to be the needle in the haystack that could break open the whole thing. So you collect as much data as you possibly can. And generally, as long as you've lawfully collected that data and there's no intervening statute, judicial opinion, or regulation, you can repurpose it. And also, too, these, these two models of data collection have different implications for the government as a, as a data steward. So the covert nature of national security means that surveillance has led to distrust. Um, and then when you take mosaic theory and you're collecting all this information and able to cross-reference it, that leaves the opportunity for potential aggregation problems with respect to, to privacy and what it can reveal about a person. Um, and then national security tends to have greater implications for people's civil liberties. So when you're talking about public health, you might have isolation or quarantine as a result, but national security has you know, immigration and law enforcement 
kinds of implications. So we really thought that these are two separate kinds of a kinds of paradigms. And because you know, when we're thinking about digital contact tracing, including in the current pandemic, um, this is a public health initiative. So that means that it should adhere to the norms and the goals of public health. Um, and it's not just enough to get the information by itself. You actually do need people to cooperate uh, because Bluetooth pings and geolocation data don't convey crucial information like you know, how long you were in touch with a person or whether or not one of you was in a mask or even separated by a wall. So it's our argument that to cultivate the necessary trust, public health officials should minimize collection and limit subsequent use in an effort to gain trust. Um, but despite the public health purposes, and I want you to stop sharing my screen now because I don't think it's necessary. Despite the public health purposes of di digital contact tracing, individuals regarded it with a lot of skepticism, right? And many of these programs didn't take hold. And, and we can ask ourselves why? And we think it's in part because of distrust. So when asked about digital contact tracing, people not only express distrust with the government, but also uh, new technologies kind of generally and big tech. And so we believe that, that this means that individuals that are interested in successful digital contact tracing need to do more than in perhaps traditional other kinds of disease control situations to gain the necessary public trust. Um, and these, we found that the fact that um, individuals are, or the fact that digital contract tracing efforts have not been especially popular in the United States, might just be due to many anxieties traditionally associated with national security because digital contact tracing tools and national security surveillance tools look really similar and it boils down to one word, which is technology. So if you want folks to feel comfortable with digital contact tracing, you're going to have to do a little bit more. Um, you are, we are in fact using technological tools that look a lot like national security to do the work of public health. Um, and we think that it is entirely possible to cultivate the necessary public trust. It's our hope that we can do this before the, the next pandemic. Um, to start, it's not enough to let the industry regulate itself. So Google and Apple did their best to create something that was trustworthy, but still I think three out of five Americans were interested in using the technology. We might also consider statutory approaches. So something like the GDPR, but also perhaps a public health emergency specific data protection statute might be something that could be more likely to pass the United States. Um, we could also look to regulatory approaches, probably national security regulation like minimization procedures won't be enough, but giving the FTC some authority to be able to engage in oversight, particularly for some of the consumer products might be useful. Um, and some of the proposed statutes would charge the FTC with enforcement. Um, so we don't think that any of these potential trust building, um, trust building approaches alone will be sufficient, but we think a combination of the three, so if you have industry, innovation and commitment to transparency, privacy and data security, along with legislative interventions to set standards and offer remedies, and finally regulatory oversight to monitor and enforce, um, that these three things combined might then give us the necessary trust to get the buy-in for people to want to use these technologies. Um, and it's our hope that if we can commit to this kind of a hybrid approach going forward, we can have the necessary infrastructure in place to engage in successful digital contact tracing. And I am afraid I spoke too long, but that is all I have. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Jessica. I, I appreciate it. All right. So next we have uh, Brenda Leong, who's going to talk with us about contact tracing and civil rights. Thanks, Woody. Thanks very much for the invitation to talk today. I'm never letting you introduce me again, though, because that's way too much pressure. Um, so hopefully I can live up to that uh, warm <laughs> evaluation of, of my contribution. Um, I do want to talk today about contact tracing and civil rights. Um, Evan Selinger and I had written a piece recently for um, an OECD outlet talking about this specifically and it seemed to fit in really well with the topic of today's event and so thought I would reiterate a couple of the, the key points from that that we um, you know presented and concluded there were sort of 
baseline threshold questions to be considered in this context. So this is a little bit of a variation for me from the work that FPF generally does, which is more focused directly on the privacy risks or the privacy implications of data collection and sharing to, to broaden that picture out to include the civil rights impacts um, you know, more generally. So includes both an individual and a group or a collective community aspect to that. Obviously, we are talking about digital contract contact tracing today, as Jessica emphasized, um, since it's really pointed out, manual contact tracing has been done for a long time. And so criticisms of, if I shorthand it, criticisms of it are specifically about the digital applications of that, not, not the traditional work that um, has, has had value in many contexts through history. So our point here is that the threshold question needs to be on any kind of, um, particularly when you're taking a process like this and turning it into an automated or a technology-based system um, of something that, that you do already do or that does seem to already have value, the threshold question has to be, does this work at all? Does, does it even do what it's purported to do? Secondly, does it work well enough for the contextual task that it's being asked to do, for the, the way it's being used? And then if, if it makes it over both those hurdles, what are the short term and the long term implications for civil liberties that might be implicated that might have not been in place in a non digital version of, of a, a process or, or um, uh, you know, uh, policy in the past. So in that context, you would also ask are there mitigating versions of this are there alternatives are there ways to do it, you know, partially or differently, so that they assuage the larger risks sufficiently. Um, and how does that balancing evaluation even get done? How do, you, how do you decide whether the benefits of something that maybe works somewhat but not perfectly are worth doing if it, there are some civil rights implications as well? How serious do those have to be before you say yes or no? And I, spoiler right now, I don't have a silver bullet answer to that. So we're not going to get to the end with me giving you um, great insights into how to, to weigh those pros and cons, but at least hopefully taking away the idea that that really has to be done thoughtfully. So. To start evaluating uh, contact tracing, we would start with the question of where are we already in terms of surveillance tracking data and how that impacts our civil rights. And we can see all around us reporting um, excellent report from the New York Times last December about civil uh, about cell phone um, location data tracking and how much they were able to infer by gathering some of that um, data and seeing, you know, identifying people who were supposedly not identifiable and not only identifying them, but tying them to multiple aspects of their, of themselves, their work, their home, their hobbies, their travel, whatever that might be. So we know that this is already um, a, a big concern and a big threat in terms of tracking of individuals based on their data. And we don't have a lot of protections in place against this yet. There have been a series of court cases that have tried to address controls or limitations on this. Everything from limiting access to the cell phone itself if you're arrested and taken in. Um, but there's you know, still a lot to be resolved in that in terms of if you have a biometric access to your phone, they might be able to force you to give access, whereas if it's a password, they can't, um, which is not really sensible in the modern world, but there we are. And then um, physical tracking of the of you via a device that's somehow attached to you versus just collecting data after the fact from your cell phone provider. And what are the time frames that are reasonable? You know, in Carpenter, they decided that seven days was some kind of magic number that that less than that could be obtained and more than that would require different levels of process or service. So all of that is still very unsure, very unprotected in a sense, and, and the implications on our civil rights are not entirely clear either, although I think we all sort of feel intrinsically that those things are a threat that need to be addressed um, before it's out of our control. So does contact tracing work then? Well, when infection rates are low and there's sufficient testing available, probably probably at a level that, that makes it useful. Early in the pandemic, we saw some success of this in various countries um, around the world and it seems to have some value. There are a lot of variations though in the kind of apps that are used, how they're used, who collects the data. Is it a GPS or a Bluetooth based system? Is there central storage of, of data in a, a, you know, is all the data funneled into a central repository in terms of like a health agency and a government? Um, or is data kept locally on the device? What are the adoption rates? What's the compliance with the protocols of going into quarantine if you're notified that you might have been exposed? Um, and what are the notification levels broadly to the facilities and businesses and other um, parties to this in addition to the individuals? And then again, it all comes down to what is the ease and availability and speed of 
testing accuracy, which is of course one of the places where the US has struggled the most. What are the risks of digital contact tracing then? Access by new players to new types of data uh, on your phone and device. If we're already concerned about the amount of data that's being collected, particularly location and tracking, now we have more agencies and groups, um, maybe health agencies at a state level, maybe the CDC, maybe the platform provider of whoever is, is um, producing that particular app. Um, and it's not to say any of those people have bad intentions, but you have just increased the pool of people who have access to data. Um, and then, as I mentioned, one of the key bifurcations is the storage of the data. Is it kept locally on the phone or is all this data uh, combined somewhere in a central place, which then leads to an almost overwhelming temptation for secondary uses when it's a, a vast database of individual um, records that is, can be analyzed for all kinds of other things, whether health related specifically, potentially related to pandemic controls, and then of course, potentially related to other things as well. So we find ourselves then ending up at the question of, is, is there an expected collective demonstration of an individualized behavior sufficient to stop the spread of this disease? And as I said, I think we've seen different answers to that in different countries because of all those variables that are involved. But if the answer is no, if it, it doesn't seem likely to have that impact, then it just shouldn't be done. And it definitely shouldn't be done halfway or as some sort of panacea that ends up being what has been in other places called security theater um, in the uh, desire to have been seen to do something, which Evan and I have written about this, other people have written about this, um, actually can increase the risks rather than doing nothing at all um, by making people feel safer than they are and causing them to actually act in ways that, that increase the risks. So maybe I've over, maybe it feels like I've overemphasized this question of efficacy, does it work or not? But it's really the threshold standard that too often we just roll right through and decide because there is a tech or there is a digital version of another process that we should do it without really stopping to think about whether it's going to get us what we want. And if, um, if we can make ourselves take the time to ask that question and come up with a reasonable answer and not do it, that's the safest of all in terms of the data and the risks and the other implications, especially when we come to the conclusion that it's not actually gonna give us the public health improvements or the protections that it, that it was being considered for. So in that then implication on civil rights, there's the normalization of tracking technologies. Um, we already carry our phones everywhere we go. We just sort of accept the fact that that location data is out there. We already have a lot of normalization about health data being passed around between insurers and providers and labs um, and other people. So now we're gonna you know, expand that uh, type of data, which is very sensitive and personal data into this um, bigger pool of our own breadcrumbs, digital breadcrumbs that we're leaving behind us. And then that opens the door to all kinds of mission creep. Who has access? How will the information be used? Will employers, educational institutions, insurance companies, as well as government um, actors have, have access to it? It is very difficult to quantify these impacts and to come up with some sort of balancing equation um, against a potentially useful technology. There are different risks at the individual level than at the collective level sometimes, and that makes things more complicated. Um, sometimes there is benefit, but only if enough people do it collectively, and so you have to convince individuals to do it. Sometimes there appears to be an individual incentive to do it, but then the harm comes when it's aggregated across a lot of people in a community adopting a technology. But there are clearly real threats, um, and in some cases where there's this individual group or community uh, dichotomy, that makes it harder to have that uh, consideration. Um, but basically, this sort of collective action requirement imposes these problems, and only a collective action ex examination can really assuage them. That's it. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate uh, focusing on both the efficacy, efficacy question and uh, how that affects civil rights, which I think is a, a obviously, Brenda, you know I would probably agree with this, a key component in this in, in entire debate. Um, next, Ashkan is going to talk with us about, uh, I think, proximity notification apps, right? Kind of. Okay. Let her rip. Cool. Well, thanks for having me, Woody, and, and everyone. Um, and thanks for, thanks everyone for willing to be engaged on these issues, including Google and Apple. Um, I, the comments earlier really resonated with me, particularly Brenda's comments just now, although that shouldn't be surprising given Woody 
pick the panel. Um, a quick correction, though, I don't consult for the, any, for pay, at least for any of the tech companies, although I do work with a lot of enforcement agencies and AGs to investigate them, so just wanted to make sure that's clear. Uh, right. And I have had the pleasure to work with Brian, actually, on a TV series some time ago about privacy and surveillance, so um, lots of fra uh, familiar faces here. So um, I was here, to, so just to start, I was uh, happy to hear the presentation um, by Gilles this morning about how the technology works and what the trade-offs are. I think that my key talk will be about how I kind of disagree with um, the presentation in two key areas. One is um, what those kind of privacy security trade-offs really are. And more importantly, that, um, that platforms like Google and Apple should be the ones to, to bilaterally make decisions about how those trade-offs are made. Um, and so, Quickly, we'll just talk about what those trade-offs are. We can, you know, maybe look back to March or April when we first started um, understanding the significance of the pandemic. Um, and you know, in the early stages of the outbreak, we saw a quick response by a lot of academics, a lot of, you know, platforms, a lot of um, researchers, app developers. We saw something like 50 or 60 different approaches to do contact tracing at that point. Um, we saw that Singapore and Korea had apps that were deployed. Um, other government health agencies, the UK, Australia, they wanted to build apps and tools to assist with controlling the pandemic. Um, and very quickly, we learned that, that these systems didn't work very well. Initially, because of um, restrictions on the platforms, on Apple and Google's platforms, not just around privacy, but just around performance and uh, 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 battery life. For example, apps couldn't collect certain categories of information like Bluetooth and location in the background effectively. And we had, um, as a result, a lot of false negatives or instructions. If you remember in Singapore, you were instructed to leave the app open in the foreground and leave it running. So not use your phone as a phone, but leave it, you know, as a, as a tool to always have on for these um, proximity tracing apps. Um, and there was real pressure on the platforms to do something to fix the problem. I mean, I don't mean do something in the sense of come up with an API, but as you know, I don't want to make this a discussion about market power and competition, but the two platforms are also the critical gatekeepers on what apps get approved in the app store. And so while there was a lot of concern around apps that were not were crashing or not working well or using too much battery, there was a lot of pressure on the platforms to fix the, the background collection to allow um, the health agencies and these apps to actually collect uh, the information they needed to do contact tracing. So in response, rather than kind of um, modify the platform to allow background um, Bluetooth collection, they instead created the, um, the uh, exposure notification API. Um, and I'll point out at that time, it was called the contract tracing API in its first iteration. Um, and a lot of the, what we understand now about its properties weren't actually made Clear in that first iteration, it took a lot of pressure from folks in this community and others to, to force um, clear delineation of, for example, who would have access to the platform, um, how, how apps would be approved, you know, um, how the, the privacy properties actually work separate from the API. Um, and so now we have, you know, that was, now we're at a point where we have this API. I think that was the key inflection point, right, which is at the point where the platforms then introduced um, the, the Google Apple notification API effectively taking up or sucking out all the oxygen in the room of all the other 50 different approaches, including you know, some by other governments. Um, and all the alternatives, all the diverse approaches were cut short, um, essentially forcing us all to have multiple conferences like this one about the Google Apple exposure notification API. And um, you know, surely you can still, or you could then take any other approach, right? That was a response to the French government and to the, um, initially to the UK government. Of course, you could write your own apps. It just won't work very well on our platforms, was a response. So as we often see, the key policy decisions that could impact millions of people were made pretty much bilaterally by these two large tech actors without a lot of consideration on whether those were the right um, trade-offs. And to me, the, you know, I've written about this in the past, to me, the decisions were, these trade-offs had significant implications, not just on um, kind of efficacy, but also on privacy and security, which is an area that I work on um, pretty heavily. One thing we heard today, for example, was is that the key assumption in this system was that the social graph is was the most sensitive aspect of information 
that um, we're concerned with in this in this um, in this endeavor, um, which I don't think everyone would agree with. You know, so others have pointed out particularly that you know individuals that could be discriminated against or could you know have their economic livelihood or ability to go back to work would disagree that that was the right trade-off. And as such, you know, we've highlighted that, um, uh, for example, um, separate from that, that there are privacy and security vulnerabilities. Um, there's also the, the kind of meta question that we've still not addressed, which is whether even Bluetooth proximity tracing is the right approach. The earlier speaker commented on that. And we all, I'm sure, are now intimately aware of all the issues around false positives and, and false negatives that could occur from a technological approach like this one. For example, if we have the phones in our back pocket, um, we're going to get significantly less signal strength and less uh, likelihood of proximity um, than if it were in our shirt pocket, right? Um, and alternatively, if you're, you know, the apps will not know whether you're wearing personal protective equipment or you're separated by walls or you're outside versus inside, right? So none of that information is available to these apps, um, but yet we're still um, uh, relying on them which I think not only leads to the issue of um, false positives, but to me significantly leads to the issue of overconfidence that, um, that we're relying on these apps, particularly when they're low on adoption, to tell us when it's actually safe to go outside. Um, some people might have seen that like in Virginia, the Virginia COVID safe app will alert you that you've not encountered someone for the last two weeks when you get this notification, which I think, you know, again, signals overconfidence because it only applies to people that also have this app running and that if it, you're in fact not falling into one of these false negative situations because of space or signal issues otherwise. Um, the, other, the other question, the, the over, is another area in overconfidence is the, tr the, the, the overconfidence that people will actually trust these systems, right? That even assume that the signal mechanism and the Bluetooth and locate or GPS based location proximity for any of these approaches are effective to tell us whether or not we've actually been in contact, a significant contact for exposure event. There is overconfidence, I think, that people will pay attention to these notifications. Like these are the same notifications that tell you, you know, you have a like on Instagram or that like Karen465 saw a person of color in on Nextdoor, right? Like I, I suspect that like they're going to get buried with all these other um, notifications, particularly uh, and 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 people are going to ignore them, particularly when it comes into uh, areas that might impact your ability to go to work or go, you know, to go, uh, you know, uh, take your kids to school, et cetera, right? We're, we're effectively, um, you know, a, a lot of the function of contact tracing, as we understand it, is not only to, um, to alert you, but to also convince you that the, the information is authentic and that, um, that you should, you know, impact your livelihood or go back to, um, you know, uh, refrain from going to work or to, to school, et cetera, which I'm not sure a, a pop-up dialogue on an app will, will, uh, will achieve. Um, the, the other kind of area to me that trust in the system is around security and abuse, an area that's um, close to my heart. Um, and I agree with the assessment that right now these issues are minimal, but the, the reason for that isn't that the protocol mitigates them properly, but it's that there is not widespread adoption, right? And so my, the, it's kind of a chicken and egg pro problem where if there were to be very widespread adoption and reliance on these apps, then the security considerations and trade-offs become very significant, right? And, and even to, um, you know, uh, some folks might have seen my back and forth with, with um, deals on this and other researchers have flagged this, that, that hijacking these platforms to generate wall, widespread false alerts is very much possible, right? So um, the uh, the you know the assumption is that they're too costly or too um, difficult to implement, and I want to just kind of dispel that myth. Um, you know, I, I, one attack I've demonstrated is that is this relay attack, which which Jill's highlighted this morning, which is um, to to just lay, lay it out. You essentially install a device and at, at some point where there's likely to be high positive, um, positive exposure events, so maybe outside a testing facility. And that device in real time relays uh, uh, these chirps, these rolling proximity identifiers, to a network of other devices that rebroadcast that. And the assumption that, and the, you know, the mitigations that we saw, the mitigation slides, were that either that 
you couldn't do this because of timing attacks, which is not true. You could just do it in real time. And two, that the, the platforms themselves um, you know, mitigate this and it would be too costly to do otherwise, which is again, not true because you can actually do that on either older phones, older iPhones, older Apple phones, um, older uh, or rooted phones. I have this uh, $40, um, let's, let's see this, this $40 uh, kind of um, Bluetooth uh, Wi-Fi based um, uh, kind of Arduino type device that you can just leave and it basically just relays, um, relays the signal to another one of these or to my laptop which then we broadcast, right? And so it would just take a botnet. You can rent a botnet online for something like about $100 a day, right? You would simply just relay um, the signal from one of these to a botnet uh, to read broadcast um, uh, in their local areas, uh, those rolling proximity identifiers. And if this device encountered a person you know, outside of a test center um, for 20 minutes that later tests positive, all of those, um, those re replayed or relayed signals, all the people that were near those, uh, those botnet endpoints would also generate alerts. And I've highlighted that this could be used to either spread widespread panic, or it could be used to just target a particular you know, district or particular um, uh, voting district during just before an election. Right, and so the response has been that it's too expensive and too unlikely. I would argue that it's only unlikely uh, to the degree that um, it's currently um, not widespread. If this became a widespread and widely used platform, then the likelihood of an attack like that would go up. Um, and so, uh, you know, we uh, folks might have seen the the Wall Street Washington Post headline today that the FBI is expecting mass scale disruption around the election. And I think this is n another example of kind of short-sightedness about the fact that we've created yet another vector that could be used to, to sow disruption if you wanted to. Uh, which then, uh, uh, probably we're running out of time, I'll just go through quickly, brings me to my second point, which is that, um, that the, the decision on what these trade-offs were, were made bilaterally, right? Um, and not only around the privacy, security, and kind of abuse concerns that I highlight, but also around the efficacy Right, the fact that the earlier speakers have, have also flagged that, that even though this was initially described as a contact tracing protocol, it was later changed to exposure notification protocol. And as many health officials and others have argued, um, this system that introduces all these concerns that I just highlighted um, may not actually effectively um, uh, fulfill the role of actually what we need for contact tracing. Um, for example, being able to identify where there's widespread outbreak or for example, being able to convince someone to actually stay at home um, or uh, you know, reliably quarantining in place, right? And so um, I think because of, because of this decision, uh, for example, that social graph is more sensitive than the practical status and decisions around trade-offs, we're, um, you know, we're now kind of locked into uh, this platform or this system without being able to explore other, um, other approaches. And this goes back to you know the, the fact that, um, like in other areas, um, large kind of these large incumbents are able to completely capture our attention and force us to focus on their platforms rather than the pressing problems that we need to address to uh, deal with this pandemic. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ashkan. I really appreciate it. Uh, insightful as usual. Um, and so we'll, um, Brian is going to uh, take us home in terms of talks, and then we're going to move to a, a Q&A uh, format. I'll ask a few questions, but it, in the audience for attendees, if you'd like to start putting questions in the Q&A um, uh, queue, uh, then uh, we can try to get to them uh, either by typing or we'll try to pick them and answer them uh, in the, in the Q&A period, so just FYI. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Go ahead. Well, special thanks to Athena, Gene, and Woody for making me absolute dead last in the day. And uh, I, I like to call that the on the other hand slot. And uh, I've been watching with trepidation all day uh, whether my points were going to get taken by other people. And uh, mercifully, uh, most of them weren't, which either means they're deeply insightful or tremendously boring and irrelevant. But I will try to jam at least four minutes of content into my 10 minutes. Um, 
I wanted to come at this from the standpoint of a policymaker, which I was in a couple different administrations, in particular after 9-11, 2001, uh, in the area of trying to decide what sort of technologies to use to fight terrorism and how to protect privacy and civil liberties while doing that. And I wanted to highlight two uh, what I think are essential best practices in making these sorts of decisions. And uh, Brenda scooped me on the most important one, uh, which is, uh, as she said, seems obvious when you say it, but it often escapes policymakers in, in the emergency moment, which is when you're considering any new technology or program with the potential for privacy, civil liberties infringement, the technology has to be proven to work first before you even get to the question of the privacy and civil liberties and data protections implications. And that's just a critical thing that I think we all should be keeping in mind. But on the other hand, we also have to consider the risks and benefits of the alternatives. So my institute, the UCI CPRI, did a big conference on election hacking a couple of years ago, which if you're up in the middle of the night, like right now in Europe, and you want to go to C-SPAN, you could be like the eighth, ninth, and 10th people to watch it. Um, but we talked about the possibility of hacking electronic voting, but then we had to remind ourselves that yes, those are risks. There's risk with electronic voting, there's risk with in-person voting, there's risk with mail-in voting. But remember in the year 2000 in the United States, we had the hanging chad in Florida. So maybe, you know, in-person paper voting is not without its risks either. And similarly, after 9-11, when we were looking at various measures and technology to prevent future terrorist attacks, you had to consider the privacy and civil liberties implications, but you also had to consider the risk of the government resorting to much worse methods like martial law if the more reasonable methods didn't prevent the next attack that was much worse than 9-11. Um, and you had to consider other trade-offs like if the government collects more information about you, in a way, that's a privacy invasion. On the other hand, if it prevents you from being mistaken for a terrorist and taken out of line in the airport and put in a holding cell, that protects your civil liberties. So my only point is we definitely have to absolutely consider the privacy and civil liberties risks of digital exposure notification and contact tracing, but also what's the alternative? You know, if we don't do this successfully, do we lead to unacceptably more spread, more sickness, and more death? And if we didn't go down the road of digital uh, uh, exposure notification, uh, does that would that have meant that a lot fewer people would have participated in contact tracing because of low adoption, and particularly with people my daughter's age that would much rather have their app do something quietly than get a phone call from someone? So I just put those those kind of things in context as we're as we're considering these trade offs. The main thing I wanted to talk about briefly though, uh, and I'm just so relieved that all the experts on, in this area like Oshkan and others didn't get to this, um, is, is I think we should pull the lens back a little bit. We've talked about privacy risk, we've talked about civil rights risk, we've talked about civil liberties risk in Europe, they would call it human rights risk. But what do we really mean by that? What are the interests that we're trying to protect against in the context of contact tracing and exposure notification. And so just for a little tutorial for those of you who unlike Oshkan and Woody and I and others are not steeped in this stuff, um, the fair information practices uh, actually which form the sort of spine or the backbone of, of, of a lot of, of modern data privacy protection and privacy protection, uh, contrary to what you might hear in some quarters were actually developed in the United States uh, by the health and uh, what was then health education and welfare department in 1973 and those principles were minimal collection so only collect as, as much data as you need to get the job done make sure you have high quality and current data and then it's kept updated only use the data for the purpose collected and that's of key relevance in this context because uh, one of the things I'm going to get to is normally you would want to set a very firm sunset on kind of data that's collected in an emergency, um, even a self-destruct mechanism. But in this case, I don't know because epidemiologists are going to probably want to be able to have this data to do meaningful research in the future. But anyway, um, only use it for the purpose collected, keep the data secure, uh, minimize uh, accessibility to it. When you can, you should have individual consent and control over the data. And this gets a little bit to Jessica's 
distinctions between public health and national security. I believe all of the apps in the United States are not only opt-in, but you have to actually, in most cases, be approved by your state government to use it. Um, but that's an issue. Some countries, they're mandatory, as we talked about. And then accountability for the people that are collecting and holding and using the data. And so those are the fair information practices. After 9-11, there was a lot of work around how do you catch terrorists without unduly limiting uh, privacy and civil liberties. And I was a, a privileged to be part of the Marco Foundation Task Force that came up with some uh, additional measures, uh, didn't come up with them, but sort of codified them. Uh, Real-time and immutable auditing, the importance of being able to deter bad behavior with people who have access to data and also catch it if it's happening. And also not just bad behavior, but inadvertent misuse, uh, people just making mistakes differentiated access. So not everyone who's involved in a project needs to know everything all the time. Selective revelation, meaning you have to produce a predicate reason why you need something. And then if you need more detail about a particular subject, you have to prove why you need that more detail. Um, I mentioned earlier, automatic and regularized data destruction, or at least some sort of system where uh, when data is collected, it's presumed that it will be destroyed at a certain point unless uh, individual accountable person, you know, signs an electronic document that says, here's why we need to keep it longer. Uh, many of these principles have been enacted into law in the United States. Uh, additional responsible data use principles in the context of a pandemic could include try to match the data that you collect to decisions that are necessary as public health decision makers. A prior speaker put this in terms of share wisdom, not raw data. Um, beware of the shiniest new technology. Just because it's new and interesting doesn't mean we have to find a use for it. Um, try to, and we may, the horse may already be too far out of the barn now, but we should try to always set the d data use rules before we actually collect the data, rather than trying to make it up as we go along. Uh, create robust data governance processes and oversight. Uh, I think it's unclear. I haven't studied all the various contact tracing schemes in the various states in the U.S., uh, much less overseas, but at, at least a lot of the governors are paying lip service to that concept. Um, respect the individual liberties and dignity of every person. Um, just because there's a good reason to have someone's health data doesn't mean uh, you don't have to be careful with it and protect it. And then, as I said, um, set an end date uh, to get rid of this information unless there is some clear articulated reason to keep it. And then finally, and I put this in the chat uh, earlier, I probably put it in the wrong place though, there was a little bit of a debate going back and forth about, well, do we wanna trust, or would we rather trust Google and Apple or would we rather trust the US or, or other governments? And my view is in, in, in modern times, that's a completely false choice because any gov almost any government can get any information that a private company has with very little legal process. In some countries, no legal process at all. So I don't think we should make a presumption that it's better that uh, big data is in the hands of the private sector or it's better in the hands of the government. The point is, I think, to build in the right protections and hold people accountable regardless of whether it's the government or the private sector uh, doing the collection. And that's 32 seconds left. Um, so I just would make one other comment uh, to, to one of Jessica's points. I think the, uh, the difference between public health and national security is very well taken. I think it's also collapsing a little bit over the last few decades. Um, if in Europe, for example, under prior data protection rules, national security was kind of completely exempted from the data protection directive and now it's not fully in the GDPR but it's more applicable and likewise I think even with even with what the Supreme Court in the United States might turn out to be soon I think there still may be enough votes in that court to do a reverse version of the mosaic theory to basically say even if the government had a lawful reason to collect a piece of information doesn't necessarily mean that without a warrant, they get to combine it with any other information they want and do whatever they want with it. And, and Jessica's right, historically, that has been the law in the United States. Once you've lawfully collected it, there are very few controls over what you could do with data if you're the government. But I think that might be changing and I'm exactly out of time. Thank you. Wow.
excellent job, Brian, both with punctuality and with the substance of the talk. Um, so that actually leads perfectly into the question that I was going, I'm, I'd like to ask a few questions of the panel at large, and all of you can respond if you want, because we've left plenty of time for Q&A. Before we do that, I, Brian, do you have a list of those recommendations anywhere that you could post as a link somewhere? Because there's a, I was, try, I was furiously scribbling trying to write down um, what what you were uh, describing as as sort of sort of additions to the standard set of fair information practices, but I missed it. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll put a couple links in the chat. Great, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, everyone that's attending, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in the. Uh, Q&A and we'll start pulling from those as well because I, I want to make sure uh, to answer your questions but I had a few burning questions for the panel for everybody um, uh, and uh, everyone can sort of chime in and the first question is um, in order to regain the trust necessary for meaningful disease surveillance, which is a lot of what we heard sort of threading through a lot of these presentations. Um, and Brian touched on this a, a little bit. It, is it enough to uh, take what we consider to be sound data protection wisdom, which is the fair information practices. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, let's say we require law enforcement to get warrants for everything, or we put a solid wall between law enforcement and public health authorities. Is it enough to sort of turn that dial up to 11 for the public to uh, regain enough trust to, to participate in the ways that we would require for meaningful public health and disease surveillance? Um, or one of the things I worry about is would that backfire because doing what we've already done in terms of using the existing legal tools we have is sort of what caused the erosion of trust in the first place. And I worry about particularly if we leverage uh, uh, the regulator's favorite tool for data protection right now, which is the consent button. Are we just going to, you know, like what Ashkan said, drown in notifications? Like, I agree, I agree, I agree. That's the, that's the purported, you know, that, that's the way you fix privacy. You turn the, the FIPS dial up to 11. Is that enough? Or is this a time for us to stake out new and interesting ways forward on uh, disease surveillance in ways that actually can benefit data protection and privacy rules as a whole? Well, I just want to say excellent Spinal Tap reference. You don't get that in too many, uh, in too many privacy conferences anymore. Um, no, I, th I think, just not to, not to repeat myself too much, but I think one big confidence building measure that I haven't seen talked about too much is for these governments, the state governments, to make it clear how long they're going to hold the data and what they're going to do with it and what exceptions there are. Um, I, I disagree a little bit with Ashkan. I, I think if I, ha I don't, I live in Washington state, so I don't have an exposure notification app yet, but if I had it and that, that popped up, that would get my attention a lot more than my Instagram feed, uh, for sure. Um, but I also think consent is not enough. I think we, we should be thinking about some innovative ways to not only not normalize this and let this kind of surveillance move into other national security agencies uh, 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 applications, but also to make it clear that it's going to end until the next pandemic, which I completely agree with someone earlier, there will be. I, I will just add one point, not on the, the um, basically on, on a, a, a ratcheting the other direction, which is with the latest OS updates, as folks know, the um, API, and if you, if enabled, even without an app running, the API will kind of log those exposure events until the point you hit consent, at which point it will have kind of a, a, a backwards looking log of those exposure events on your phone, which I thought is an interesting um, pivot to the consent. Typically we, we consent from the point forward and it go, it's kind of, we will begin using this app. The, the platforms have taken the position that um, backwards looking collection should happen um, until the point at which users wanna go ahead and download and consent 
the Washington State app, you'll have some, some history to start with. So I thought that's a different pivot there. I would um, just like to kind of question the restore trust aspect. I'm not really sure in the last digital modern age, there's been a lot of trust to restore, honestly. Um, and especially in our current environment, I think that question is so broad and complex, way beyond even just the pandemic, um, that it, it's going to have really complicated answers. But I want to push back on one of the things Brian said, which is I think part of the problem and, and relates to the trust or confidence issue is that in the US, we haven't put a lot of these things into law. Um, some of them have become sort of accepted practices, or they might sort of fall under like FTC rulings or, or guidance or things like that, which has a regulatory effect. But we don't have a national privacy law. We don't have an underlying right to privacy in more broadly outside of the, the Fourth Amendment context. And I think one of the way, sorry, my dog is barking in the background. One of the um, ways to, to achieve some level of trust or confidence is to follow that path and come up with a, a version of the FIPS or some framework standard that puts in some expected standards, minimum criteria for how long you hold data, limits on secondary uses and sharing, um, uh, you know, standard deletion, um, uh, controls other than just consent that bind the people that hold it so they can't use that as their, their escape clause. Um, and that that would be part of any strategy that's going to create or restore uh, any kind of trust. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I don't think I said that we had already accomplished all that. Well, all I was trying to say was the, the FIPS were originally, I, I know what, what the problem is. I said the word codified. Really what I meant was written down, not written down into law. Um, and there are, as you know, there are some national, uh, both cybersecurity and privacy and breach disclosure laws. And, you know, if we had a Congress that could function, you would think that those would be one of the easiest sets of things to agree on. But uh, I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it in the calendar for this year. Yeah, so I want to jump in and say that, um, you know, that's why I think, at least with, with my colleagues, when we were thinking through this, we feel like there needs to be like a th at least a three level approach, right? Where you have industry who are the innovators and the designers thinking creatively beyond, you know, what we can do with consent and how to design the technology. And then we definitely need, I think, some kind of data protection law. It seemed nice that, that there was at least some bipartisan action, at least at some point to safeguard data privacy, although I think it, um, it, that also stalled out. Um, and then, you know, the, the regulatory piece too, because these statutes don't, I mean, they, they literally don't enforce themselves. So it's useful to have like agency oversight, something like the, the FTC or even some kind of data protection agency maybe. But I think like we, we, need, we need all of the solutions. So maybe it's another Swiss cheese approach, right? We just need to layer them on top of each other and then, and then maybe we'll get the trust we never had. Well, if I could just add one thing about trust is I also think about value to the person who is giving out the data. I mean, why do people, um, why do people use apps or use various tools in which we willingly, for you know, give up our data and, and become the the um, you know become the product? It's because we get a value out of it. And so I think we can think about what is the value that an individual gets out of that surveillance. And that's when we really start thinking about things like accurate disease forecasts um, that are individual. That I mean, what what actionable information can does the individual get from giving up something? And so I think that that's where you where I think most people. Well, on a daily basis, I mean, someone like me does, but on a daily basis, people don't, you know, walk around saying, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm really so glad that there are disease surveillance systems, you know, <laughs> so, um, so think, I think that that's one, I mean, obviously, that most of this is a, is a legal question, but I do think that there's a small part of, of what does the, what does the individual get in return? That, that I want to build off of, of something that, Brenda got me thinking about that this whole, this whole, everyone's answers got me thinking about, which is thinking practically about what the best path forward is. So let's, let's talk sort of real politic here. Is it better to try to craft a solution specifically for COVID? So, so temporary, a lot, a lot of what uh, I've heard about some of the things and, and uh, a lot of the concerns about what, uh, uh, Google and Apple are doing with their API is that, well, it's just temporary and, and they, they assuage concerns that way. They say, this is not long-term. 
right? We're gonna engage in some heavy surveillance because this is unprecedented, right? COVID is, is a brand new thing. And so it makes me wonder if the solution should be similarly short term. And there are ways that you can do that. You can put sunset provisions into legislation. You can uh, enact COVID specific legislation or pandemic specific legislation, but not have it affect the broader policy. Or since the whole sort of purpose of the fair information practices and data protection law generally is to safely and sustainably process data for useful benefits. Is this actually an opportunity that we've never had before to actually revolutionize our data protection framework so we shouldn't just make it COVID related um, or short term, that it actually should be a long term project? Or is that too heavy a lift politically speaking? I'd love to know everybody's thoughts on the right, the, the, the specific right way to move forward on this. I mean, my my thought is it's much easier to do like a like a like a sting in the sense that we're in the midst of a public health crisis and then try to perhaps build off of that. But that just seems like the easier thing to do politically because there was at least some effort to to do that relatively quickly at, at least early on. Not that that's the best, but that's the most workable right now, maybe. Well, yeah, politics is the art of the possible, right? I guess that's. Um, well, I, 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 having <laughs> having lived through trying to implement recommendations of blue ribbon panels, I hate to recommend a blue ribbon panel, but I do think that we really, I don't think we will, but I think we really need to strike while the iron's hot, because I'm sure this was Julie's experience with some of the prior viruses. Once we get past this, once there's a vaccine, once people feel safe, it's just going to go off everyone's radar screen. So if there were any possibility of real legislation, what I would do is I would get the five or 10 key principles into a clean piece of legislation, get it up right now, but not say COVID-19 only, you know, define pandemic to include COVID-19. And you could even have the law called, you know, no future COVID or something, but define the term pandemic to include much more than just COVID. I still think it's hopeless, but that's what I would do. I think the um, the answer to part of your question was almost everything is a non-starter at this moment in the U.S. Um, for for at least the next couple of months, for sure, which is a long time in pandemic life. So, um, but were it possible, I also think it doesn't need to be an either or. I think you know it is an opportunity. We do need to seize it. Our immediate emergency is immediate so we need to address it to the extent that we can but hopefully it can be done in a way that as brian said can be then extended either um more comprehensively written that that encompasses the future and you know with an eye to trying to do that in the terms um or at least in a way that could then be sort of like you know built on the next time as, as we assume there probably someday will be uh, a next time it occurs well, there's also lots of things that are, uh, lots of actions that are triggered by a, a public health emergency. So, I mean, if we look for a middle path, you know, there are a number of powers and activities that can only take place if there's a public health emergency, um, which is a, obviously a very, is a broad category of activity that, you know, that can be declared by certain peoples in the, in the, certain people in the U.S. government or certain roles in the U.S. government. So one could imagine, and one can also have a public health emergency that stands over a long period of time just because someone says it's a public health emergency. So you could always, you could say that influenza is a public health emergency till the end of time, and you could always, and then certain powers or certain uh, um, protections or certain authorities could always be around that public health emergency. So I guess my point is, is that if there's, I would certainly never recommend anything being specific to COVID-19 because all we know is that we're going to have something else like this and why would we ever want to start again? But if we're not, if it, it wouldn't be tenable to go all the way to have things all the time, then there is a middle path. Yeah, it seems like you would in the very least want something that was, I mean, we've been, it, it, this is sort of like, we're gonna have some surveillance, but only for the war on drugs or something like that, which is like, been, you know, going on forever. And so in the very least, you, it, what is familiar in the US system of, of data protection law is creating uh, subject specific kinds of frameworks, right? So we protect children and we protect financial information. So it wouldn't be that unheard of to try to create a long-term sustainable solution for disease surveillance. 
Uh, I want to go to some of the questions that are popping up uh, in some of the, the chats, the panelist chat and the Q&A. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll go back to some questions, some other questions that I had. Um, so Nalini says to all panelists, I would like to hear some more about uh, what retention and erasure policies are meaningful from a public health point of view. How long does COVID specific information about individual contacts need to be held to have utility? That's a good question. <laughs> well, so, uh, speaking as the person with the least expertise in it, uh, I would say it, it really depends on what type of data is collected and the degree to which it's useful to epidemiologists and especially the degree to which it could stay useful to epidemiologists after it's been uh, anonymized, stripped of personal identifiers. Now, before Ashkan jumps in and tells me how easy it is to re-identify data that's been de-identified, <laughs> Um, you, you would have to have some confidence that the de-identification was real, and I don't even know cryptographically if that's possible anymore. But um, I think the duration of the hold just depends on what the researchers are going to do with it, right? I don't know, Julie, do you have any thoughts on how long that is? Well, I mean, it's forever. I mean, it was like, you're giving me, you're giving me the sweat. The idea of throwing away data is so uncomfortable. <laughs> so, but, and, and it is certainly far outside my area of ex expertise about if de-identified data, you know, are truly de-identified. And we would, cer I certainly think most people in public health would want them to be that. Those are the data that, that, you know, for, for epidemiologists, for, future dissertations to come. Those are the data that are, um, that are incredibly valuable and are pain, you know, frankly, a little painful to think about um, discarding. So um, it would seem to me as, as an epidemiologist by training that what would be, I would love for a lot of concentrated action to be on truly think, finding ways to de-identify data if, those are, if it is very difficult um, to do that so that those data could be held. I think that the data where that you one would use for contact tracing, you know, the exact people and who knows who, who's doing who, I, I, you know, doing what with who, I don't know if that needs to be held on for very long at all. And certainly that feels uh, most vulnerable on any number of levels. Yeah, so I, I, I would think, right, so, uh, so I don't know how the public health research works, but that you'd be able to keep data on the trends and the disease progression and all of that for future research without needing to know, like, whose cell phone pings someone else's cell phone. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, like, in other areas of law that have been in, res like, like a, that have been in response to the public health emergency, I mean, you see language that says something like you'll keep the information for the duration of the emergency, whatever that means. Um, it, it could, you know, if the governor's declared a state of emergency, maybe you could tie it to something like that, since a lot of these are state level things. Um, but I think like there's, there's a lot of potential ways where you could say, or you could just say, you know, two years from collection, or uh, I, I don't know, but I think legally there's a lot of different ways that you could try to cabin how long you're gonna keep it. It, it might be interesting for some governor at the end of this current crisis, whenever that is, to basically hold the data for, let's say, an extra 100 days and invite a lot of the people that are on this webinar or other experts in re-identification to come in and see what they can do with it and see what a risk it is to keep that kind of data, because maybe it's catastrophic, maybe there's none, who knows? I do think one of the challenges is making that delineation but the data, so there, there's essentially data collected for the purpose of responding to the pandemic. And then there's data that can be used uh, to respond to the pandemic, independent of whether what was collected for that purpose. And we saw very early on in April, we saw all these like ad tech and bitstream vendors using data. Folks might remember the visualization of people that went to Florida and you know, went to the beach and then went, you know, uh, traveled to different parts of the country. That was all basically data to, to show intersections, GPS-based data to show intersections of people as well as show where they travel to. That was essentially used to determine uh, spread, even though it was not collected for that purpose. So, so there's also that tension where, where if, there, if it isn't collected for this purpose, people will just go elsewhere and find it. And we, we see that 
clean right here. So I'm not sure how to delineate it's the same data, but it was collected for a different purpose. Yeah, is there, is there any sense of, of uh, what the thread modeling is for public health data over time with respect to de-identification? Because, because I, I get the sense that as time goes by, the, th the threat risk changes. Does it, I don't know, maybe we need to talk to someone that does de-identification work. Well, I, I know this, Woody, that in general right now, almost any kind of, and even before COVID-19, but especially now, almost any kind of healthcare related data fetches more on the black market than credit card data, than social security numbers, than almost any other kind of data, because it's so useful in insurance fraud in pirating research in who knows what these, you know, adversary governments are doing it, doing with that data, but, but it's very, very valuable. That yeah, that tracks. I can I can I can see exactly how that is. So that does sort of change our our um, our threat modeling a little bit on that. Scott Jordan asks: Both CCPA and GDPR contain some exceptions to certain privacy requirements for certain. Oh, did it just get answered? Oh, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna ask I was gonna ask the whole panel if anyone wanted to um, respond to Scott's question, but then I lost it. And I don't know where. Well, so, well, let's see if people disagree. What I what I said, I I feel like I have to answer Scott quickly because he and I work together. Um, well, can uh, you repeat the question fully? Uh, yeah, uh, he was asking. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, now I've moved into the. Uh, 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 it's hard to find now, but. I don't know, Scott, if you want to just ask it. You want me to read it? I've got it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Both CCPA and GDPR contain some exceptions to certain privacy requirements for certain types of research, but we've repeatedly struggled when writing these laws with what the ex exception should be and what types of research should qualify. Any thoughts on these issues given the current situation? Right. So, so for what it's worth, my, my response was I, would, I think it's better to build a set of criteria uh, kind of a risk assessment balancing criteria for something like in Europe, a data protection authority, or potentially in the US, the Federal Trade Commission or someone to judge big research projects by rather than try to write into the law an exception that's going to be able to imagine everything that we're going to want to do in the future. The problem with that is it does leave a lot of power in the hand of bureaucrats and it's kind of cumbersome. But to me, I'd rather see the law say, Okay, here's the risks you got to balance if you're going to hold data for research, and you know here's the responsible authority to make that decision. I mean, there's also you know existing structure around use of data for research in the form of IRBs and things like that now. So whether that needs to be expanded or explicitly made to address health data or health data collected in a public emergency as sort of its own special category or you know what harms are going to be weighed what consent levels are or are not required are all sort of potentially new or new old questions in a new context um, but I mean there are some structures and, and processes in place now that could be used with an explicit set of factors provided or as Brian said a you know sort of detailed process around this content this use case that could be the the vehicle for that if you know if that was something that that was agreed upon or you know seemed sufficient um, I personally you know have a lot of of hesitation about that with all due respect to the idea that you know more data yields more information that's kind of the problem um and so you know we kind of have to get over the idea sometimes that just just because there's data and we could do things we really maybe still shouldn't um uh, of yeah. course one, one other approach is consent you know when you collect you you could have a screen in the 47 screens that you click on when you accept the app that says it could be used for research but i think we'd all agree that that kind of consent is not super effective yeah, I mean, all of this I mentioned when I started talking that where I, I've done most of my privacy thinking in the past relates to genetics. And these are all really common questions in the, like in the context of genetics. People always want 
access to more data and they want you know to be able to use it for longer and cross reference it with other data and you know i i think that at least in the context of like consumer genetics i mean all, all you do have is a box that you check and you say that i agree to share it with researchers and we think that that's enough in that context and then depending on who's doing the research like if we're talking about certain kinds of health data you know you have like the common rule coming in and, and things so there are so there are research regulations once we get in if if research is the type of secondary use that we're talking about we enter then a new a whole new framework i think related to to privacy and how we deal with the data but i think that you know depending on what the research is at least when I've been thinking about um, sort of the this, this secondary subsequent use issues here, I'm not worried about the data so much as I'm worried about the, the government. I mean, I'm not worried about, I'm worried about the data. I'm not worried about research on the data so much as I'm worried about the, the government. Um, and as far as, you know, secondary or subsequent use goes, I feel like, you know, research, assuming it's, you know, good research is, is, is not the worst of the potential reappropriations although maybe it's undesirable and we sh but we do need to get consent unless it's de-identified etc cetera, etc cetera. i just i just want to uh, recommend everyone jessica wrote a great paper on uh the genetic information non-discrimination act and privacy well you've actually written a lot of papers on the genetic information non-discrimination act the one that i most recently read is the one i'm putting in the chat um i just want to uh, want to follow a question so is it the opinion of folks here that the information we're talking about, essentially proximity to someone else, independent of the coronavirus test, is that, are we talking about that's kind of medical information? Are we describing that? Because at the, at the core, the th like separate from whether or not you've been tested and infected, the information we're talking about is literally our social graph, as we would describe it, right? And so are we describing that as medical information or are we talking about something different? Or location information? Yeah. Can I jump in and say that this is such a, I think this is a great question for people that do health research. Oh, I, so I'm hosting a workshop in my, at my center that the theme of it is, is all data health data now, right? If you look at, you know, the people you have interactions with or your zip code is all deeply predictive of health and we have the social determinants of health. And so we are kind of in this strange world where social, social interactions are, do in fact inform health research in a way that might not, even though they are not what we would call traditional medical or health information. And so, you know, when you're thinking about, I guess, like, you know, Bluetooth pings or um, geolocation data, that doesn't feel like health data, but it might have relevance to health research, and especially when you're talking about social determinants and stuff. Well, to me, it would depend on whether you could, with reasonable effort, identify the human beings who had those phones on them when they made the contacts. If you can't do that with reasonable effort, then I don't know how you could, I mean, if you could do that, you would know that at least one of those two people put something in their phone that said they'd been exposed to COVID-19. So then you do have health information, but I have no idea how feasible that re-identification is. Scott has a question and I want to see if I can allow Scott to talk. So I'm going to press a button and Scott, I see your hand raised. Can you talk now? Yep, that works. Um, so I just wanted to add a little bit of flavor to it. And Ashkan was also involved in heavily in CCPA, so I'm sure he has a take on this too. So when we were, when we were struggling with this on writing CCPA, the thing that occurred to us is at least those of us from the computer science side, think of internet data is so much of higher dimension than health data usually is. But health data, we usually think of it as a relatively limited number of fields in a table or a couple of tables. In the internet, there's just all of this rich information that gets put together in almost a really high dimensional way. But then kind of the next questions that always come up was, one, who qualifies as a researcher? Are we just talking academia? In which case the um, HRBs come up, although in most universities, HRBs are really horrible at dealing with computer science research. Um, or, you know, companies, of course, claim, hey, we do research. And then, as Jessica mentioned, right, the government has its own angle on this. So that was one whole set of questions, is who qualifies. And the other set of questions was, okay, 
if it's for a good purpose, quote unquote, by research, then is it that we have a lower threshold? For instance, typically we might think of it as pseudonymous with a key that you know gets locked away in a cabinet um, versus de-identified a much stronger threshold that would never let you, in theory, go backwards, right? And we never quite worked that out in CCPA and GDPR has some mushy language on this also. So I just see this coming up again and again and again if privacy legislation shows up in other places and something that I think is a really hard question to answer. I mean, I think that also too, when you're talking about research, you need to have some kind of enforcement hook, right? You know, like, is it like, are, are they getting federal funding in a way that they would be subjecting themselves to, to regulation? And so I think that, you know, who is a researcher is a really difficult question, especially when you're talking about the private companies that are doing their own research, especially if they're doing proprietary research to like, you know, make their products better or, you know, identify their consumers. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's an excellent question. I don't have a good answer for it, um, but I, I, it's a real issue, you know, who is a researcher? How are we defining research? And then if we want to regulate the research, sort of what's our hook to be able to actually engage in oversight? Anyone else? Well, just, just along those lines, if you could get, and I, I don't have an idea this may already exist, but if you could get uh, the National Science Foundation and a couple of the other big 900 pound gorilla federal research funders to adopt regulations around this that would i think cover a very large percentage of the university-based research i don't know that that would do much good for the private sector although i know there are some nsf grants that that you get the grant if you're working with a private sector company but that might be that would certainly be easier than getting legislation All right, I've got uh, another question and I was saving it sort of to the end, um, but uh, we're sort of getting relatively close to the end. So I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, thinking about this discussion around what do we do, what kind of data do we collect? How do we use it? Who, uh, what are the obligations with respect to the data? Um, and that sort of debate dominates a lot of our thinking when we talk about the realm of privacy and the pandemic, right? Disease surveillance, contact tracing, that sort of thing, is it really focuses on uh, the kind of stuff that regulatory frameworks like the CCPA and the GDPR are largely focused on. But the question that I have for all of you is I'd like to zoom out a little more and ask a bigger question, which is are, are we missing any major uh, anything major in this debate? And Brenda got to a lot of this, I think, in bringing the, the discussion around civil rights into this, but I want to see if there's anything that we're not talking about. And this can, um, and this can sort of manifest in several different ways. One, it's possible that the regulatory frameworks don't include some various aspects that we're missing, um, or the, it, one of my fears, and tell me if this is sort of wrong or not, is that what if we pass a law and it's got the FIPS turned up to 11 and lawmakers um, uh, read Brian's recommendations and they say, that's great, let's implement them all, right? This is now I'm really dreaming. Um, and we do all that and we've got some rock solid privacy protections in built into a disease surveillance system that works, right? So let's say that we take Julie's idea, um, it, which I thought was really interesting about in, it, putting testing, making that a much more normal aspect across several different fronts um, and changing the way in which we think about testing as part of disease surveillance. Let's say we do all that. Is there anything that angle that we're missing that's still going to cause that to be it to, to cause all those things to be ineffective in the end and here's what i mean by that there's a couple of things that i've worried about one of which is i'm worried about that we're not talking about surveillance technologies 
not used to necessarily violate people's privacy, but used to control people. So Oshkan made a reference to like Nextdoor, I think. What was, what was the app? Where, so to get to, so I'll go ahead and, and um, uh, give you a preview of a case study that I've been working on with a PhD student of mine, uh, Joanna Cohn. And where, where someone uses Nextdoor, they implement facial recognition technology with it. And then Nextdoor, or it's not Nextdoor, we use some you know, fake app, it's like you know, Nextdoor neighbors or something like that. Um, and uh, and they, they use facial recognition technologies to basically crowdsource quarantine enforcement, right? And that to me strikes me as something that is not that far of a stretch given that people are already talking about, well, if you see someone gathering without a mask, you should take a picture of them and upload it. Um, and that sort of thing there, and Brenda brings up the really good point, isn't controlling people the ultimate form of invading their privacy? Absolutely. But that sort of departs a little from the standard data protection as privacy narrative that's been dominating a lot of this discussion. And we haven't talked about that really yet as part of this conversation. And should it be or is that something that we should sort of bite off in a separate uh, area? And that's one thing, right? Using surveillance and sort of social pressure and manipulation um, and those sorts of techniques. And what sort of regulatory tools should we bring to bear for that particular aspect of privacy in the pandemic? And then there's another aspect that I'm thinking about, which is disinformation and the amplification of, of, of narratives that, that if widely um, adopted would, would basically run contrary to public health initiatives, right? And I'm thinking, you know, COVID is a hoax or you don't need to wear masks or masks are dangerous. Um, what if we do all the good stuff, but if we don't tackle this information, is it still going to be a problem? And, and, and are there other things like that that we're missing that unless we sort of tackle this holistically, we're really got, have sort of a myopic view on privacy in the pandemic? That's my big, that's my big question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll act like a law professor here and I'll answer your question with the question. Uh, I, I think I have a few thoughts on those two, but I think there's another huge one that can't be fixed by US legislation or regulation, but needs to be fixed. And that is some sort of more automated or non-manipulable global surveillance and I don't know if Julie or anybody on the, this, in this group knows enough about how WHO operates to know whether, you know, I don't know who's at fault, I don't care, but clearly something failed that we didn't have people on the ground or they were misled or something that we didn't understand what this thing was until it was already here. So I don't know if it's, I'm not, often to, too much of a believer in the enforceability of international agreements, but it seems like we got to collectively do something and it's in the interest of every country in the world looking forward, not looking backwards to what China did or didn't do, but looking forward to somehow institutionalize an early warning system for stuff like this. And I don't know, Julia, if it already exists and it wasn't used or what, but that seems to me to be a huge gap. I mean, you know, I won't. Uh, I won't take over a, a, a toll a, a day of something else to get into this this issue because it's it's a doozy. But you know, fundamentally, it comes down to anything that WHO does. It's they're asking the member countries to you know to behave or to comply to share. And so, you know, you can add enticements and that's in, in, in the pandemic planning realm, there's like the, um, the PIP framework, which was like trying to figure out ways to like, hey, hey, country that seems to have a lot of viruses emerge from it, you know, can you share your viruses with us? And they say, well, no, because you're going to make a vaccine with it and then we won't ever see that vaccine. So then you try to figure out like, what are the enticements for that country that has a lot of viruses so that they'll share early so that we have these, these um, a, a better sense. And so we what it really comes down to is that the WHO doesn't really have a lot of teeth. Like there's, you know, they can say, please, please, it would be really great if you did this, but then what, it, what do they do if a country doesn't? And, and so I think that that's the, oops, that's the real challenge. I'm so excited about this. I just flung out my, my headphone, but, but, you know, I think that that that's the real challenge is that how do you, 
how do you create a system that doesn't use it as, you know, to control us, but then also makes it effortless, makes it not a choice of, not a choice of some government official to say, I'll share this or I won't share it. How do you make it so that it's like, you know, like this kind of way that doesn't, that has uh, fewer humans <laughs> involved in to, um, to intervene. And that's, that's the, that's the bigger question. And it seems to me just speaking for myself, Julie Schaefer, um, that's, uh, that feels really far away in, in this context. Yeah. Well, there could be inducements, like we could offer them a belfry for their bats. <laughs> or just like vaccinate all bats. I don't know. <laughs> bats right. seem to have a lot of germs. <laughs> hey, bats probably have advocates too. I mean, the thing is, if we have, you know, we've been sitting here talking the whole time about trust and confidence issues between people in their own governments, the idea that there's going to be some kind of trust or reliance among governments is to me even a step farther in terms of likelihood or, you know, challenges between now and then, because you do have all kinds of other issues. You know, you have bad faith actors, you have using, you know, using those negotiations to achieve other things. You have using that data in secret that you have said you weren't going to do. And, you know, all these kinds of things that you're trying to second guess and play into some sort of geopolitical space. And we don't have international institutions with that kind of clout or enforcement. You know, we don't. The, the UN doesn't have that. You know, who doesn't have that? We, we just don't have those kind of in, international um, institutions. So th th there's never going to, I don't want to say never, but in our, in our world as we know it, there's not going to be a mandated level of interaction to share data or combine data. Maybe if the disease spread faster and was more deadly, you would get more people more quickly buying into, hey, we really have to do this now and we have to cooperate because we don't have any other choice. But, you know, barring those kinds of, of circumstances, I'm not sure what makes that happen. Well, yeah, I think it's going to probably be a little bit of a darker solution. I promise you that every intelligence service in the world has moved pandemic intelligence from number 37 on their operating directive to number one. And um, if I were a CIA officer right now, I'd be getting plenty of vaccinations because I know I'd be spending some time in wet markets soon. And what do you just, just to your point, the, the, or to, to these points, the, while the, um, prospect isn't currently implemented and expensive. It's not, so the nature of, for example, the distributed protocols are such that um, you, your phone is always emitting your kind of unique identifier, right? And the, the properties is that that's not tied to something. But the device that I showed you, like this little $40 device, the next version has a little camera on it, right? So all I would do is just log every proximity beacon and if associated photo of who I think was around when I saw that proximity beacon, right? Such that when the kind of the um, keys are presented to me from the key server, I can then look up and associate the photo of that person uh, from the uh, associated to the key and say, oh, it was Woody that was uh, emitting that, that positive key essentially. And therefore um, I'm gonna put you on a blacklist. So you'd need a wide, you know, you'd need a widespread, um, you know, uh, network to do that, right? You'd need, uh, you know, uh, for example, I'd need to be able to collect enough people. But if I wanted to, for example, track you, um, I could, you know, have malware on your phone. And I, other research has shown that, that, that if you have a rooted phone, this is possible. I would just log all of your emissions on your phone, uh, you know, and therefore when I receive a positive ID, I know it's you. So I think this is possible. I wonder, you know, whether national security agencies are doing this to identify whether certain people are are um, are infected or not. I think Brian, you, you might have some other thoughts, but I imagine, you know, wanting to uh, it, wanting to that information could be valuable, and therefore someone could want to do that. I will simply say that my security clearance ran out in two thousand eight. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I leave this with a, with a very strange mix of, dis, of fear and hope. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, uh, it's 5.33, so we are unfortunately out of time here.
Um, thank you all. I wish that I could give you all a rousing applause for what I consider to be, uh, for me, a really uh, uh, informational and enjoyable panel. I learned a lot and I appreciate your time. I appreciate everyone that stuck around